All right, good evening, everyone. We're going to get uh, started. No. <laughs> Today is Thursday, May 4th. Uh, welcome to special meeting budget, budget presentation. Tonight we have IT and we have the Enfield Police Department. Uh, with us tonight, uh, Paul Russell and Chief Aller Fox, along with Captain Golden and Captain uh, Keselowski. So, uh, welcome. Uh, Steve, roll call. Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala. Here. Gina. Here. Uh, Mayor Prasadi. Here. Uh, Councillor Despard. Absent. Councillor Finger. Here. Councillor Hopkins. Absent. Yeah. Councillor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Mangini. Here. Councillor Nelson. Here. Councillor Pisner. Here. Councillor Santanella. Absent. And Councillor Ungar. Here. All right. Uh, seven present, three absent. Okay. Also in attendance tonight is the Finance Director John Wilcox. And we are ready to go. So it's all yours. Okay. Very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, so the, the IT budget is uh, set up for, uh, for 2024. And our mission statement still has been strong, where we, we look to bring in technology that's forward thinking and it provides a, a, le a level of efficiency uh, for redundant and repetitive tasks throughout. So we, we've constantly have looked at different solutions in departments where we kind of went through the process improvement initiatives and look for technology to assist where it can. Um, our org chart for 2024 involves a little bit of changes. Uh, we have 10 and a half FTEs proposed, uh, four and a half in our customer and administrative support. Uh, we have three FTEs in our infrastructure support, which is all the uh, communications, linkages, and behind the walls of the network. It's really the infrastructure services. And we have three FTEs positioned or budgeted, but two of those are live and we have one opening. And we're hoping to fill one in. Uh, the, the third position is actually for succession planning. We have a network manager who's probably within two years of retirement who has 25 years of institutional knowledge and really knows the background of our network, Carl Merrick. Um, I'd like to bring in another network administrator that would allow Jason Allen, who's been here for six years under the uh, learnings of Carl Merrick, so that he can grow and become the next network manager and we'd already have a seasoned network administrator ready to go at that time. Very important because it keeps all of our security and connectivities uh, going forward. And we're, you know, we're looking for a resource that can fill that void. And our technical support side is where we provide support to the uh, end, end users, to the uh, desktops, the printers, any peripherals, and as you'll see, we've actually have over 12,000 endpoints that are supported on our network from IT and an additional number of unregistered devices that are supported as well. Uh, we have a, another opening. Um, our desktop engineer recently left back in the end of February. So that's the opening of our technical support services. That position is critical in creating the image and the profiles for every computer so that it's consistent and predictable as we roll these systems out. We know that it's going to work for our end users and they can hit the ground running and not have to worry about having any uh, issues with their machines. 2022-2023 accomplishments. Number one that we're very proud of is we received an exceptional uh, rating from the Connecticut National Guard and the Homeland Security Task Force that did a cybersecurity review and audit. Um, we were ranked as one of, as the highest municipality and just below two of the national contenders for it. So key point of that as well is that with the support that we received and being able to keep our, our network secure, our employees secure and the information secure, it also puts us in line for a top a federal grant for security. So that, 
is that everybody else said good? Okay, sorry about that. Um, and what's, it puts us in line for a, a federal grant for additional uh, security systems in, in the network. We've also completed the final phases in network and internet expansions at the JFK renovations. We've doubled the capacity for our internet requirements as we've doubled the number of devices that are accessing the, uh, the internet. JFK has um, over 500 devices that have been distributed as a, in a lab setting. Every classroom has its wired device, as well as every student has an iPad. So there's plenty of technology in that JFK, and we are supporting it with the infrastructure that we've increased over there, as well as the internet connections. Um, one of our changes in our department is that We've implemented the project management and change management modules of our service desk system, which really ties nicely with our incident management and our problem management. So now, when as we go through projects and if a problem leads to a change, we have all connected a full circle of where the support can be tied to. And it, and it allows us to be able to better predict and track where there are is, issues in the system. We also reinstated our three-year technology push with the shortage of supplies and the supply chain issues we had. We've really extended the number of years our devices are, and they're old. Uh, from the town side, they're four years, and they're really seeing their wear and tear. We, we're having a, a large volume of, of uh, repairs that we have to place on them just because of the wear and tear and the use of them. And the teachers are actually on five years. So... This coming budget includes the replacement of four and five year old technology, which really took us out of our three year leasing program. And it really, it hurt us uh, operationally, that's for sure. One of the biggest changes we, well, that we started with is we moved a lot of our applications to the cloud. Our first phase was to move, get cloud in it, uh, initiated. We uh, very first one was the Munis financial system back in 2010 and all the ways to our permitting system is cloud-based, which means the services and the provider are remote from us, and we have uh, built-in maintenance plans with those as well. Our next phase is to move the data center, the actual servers, the hardware that we have on site to the cloud, taking advantage of our Microsoft arrangement and moving the servers to the cloud, which will provide us much higher level of reliability because they are not only resilient over a multitude of data centers where information is replicated and available, but it also prevents us from having to buy, purchase all that hardware. If we were to purchase the exact amount of hardware that is provided with these cloud services, we'd be up around a half a million dollars, and we're able to purchase these cloud services at initial start of $50,000, and then incrementally, as we need to add space or services, it's added incrementally as opposed to the way we purchase it in block storage. So we would spend $200,000 year one, another $150,000 year two, whereas we may only need an additional $10,000 year two of the services we get from Azure. So it really utilizes the uh, storage and uh, com computational um, needs of the environment much more effectively. Our objectives for 2024 is our restructure and reorganize of IT support. We laid the groundwork for it by in implementing the project management and change management modules. And with our technical project coordinator retiring, we looked at it and, and decided that it made sense to add the responsibilities to our service desk coordinator that would require project management and change management. And that position would be elevated to a service desk manager. Now the manager would have uh, overriding responsibilities of the technical team. So as issues come in, the, the assignments, the, the service desk really dictates who re responds to incidents and problems. And now it'll tie it together with any of the new projects. We'll already have the history of problems that were associated with other parts of the organization that we're replacing with the, pro the project. Or change management 
which will allow us to tie all the problems together and create a, a overall change that will uh, prevent that problem from happening. So it really closes the loop on those services. Um, design and plan and implement a new network infrastructure. Uh, we, we originally started the uh, network infrastructure as a service back in 2018. We are at the refresh cycle right now, so we're getting ready to replace our network infrastructure. And at that point where we implemented it in 2018, we had almost 2,100 active ports. This new design is, is, uh, has an active port plan of over 6,000. That's how much the resources we've expanded uh, and the uh, needs for uh, technology. So this allows us to start that refresh cycle again. Um, we'll have all the latest technology for greater throughput, greater response for all the wire, wireless needs. Uh, during the pandemic, we increased our wireless needs almost tenfold because of the one-to-one -one devices that were provided out to the students as well as the teachers. So it really impacted our wireless. Um, the benefit of that is that we'll be able to provide much better coverage throughout all the schools, the towns, and public safety buildings. The implementation of a unified communications, there really has been a merge of technologies with voice, video, and notification solutions. Um, back in February of 2022, uh, federal uh, requirements for new communication systems required us to be a mandatory meeting of the carries law, which means you, can, you have to be able to dial 911 without any um, pre, pre number in front of it. Some places used to have, you have to hit the eight to get an outside line and then dial 911. Um, and that is no longer allowed in any organization. They must, you must be able to get out 911. The second part of that uh, regulation is Ray Bombs Act, which says that you also have to have a dispatchable location, which is much more than a building. So you can't have JFK or a town hall as the dispatchable location. You need to have greater details involved in that, which is town hall, ground floor, Skidico room, and even to the level, if, the, if it's a large open room, more for uh, factories, you have to also have a, a, a notation of whether it's north, south, east, or west. That way there, that information is provided to the dispatchers in written form. The person doesn't have to say it. It gets transmitted over to the dispatchers. They have all that information that when they send the emergency response team, they know exactly where to go. Oh, what's that? No. Oh. So the third part of that now also requires that each building have an identified resource that will be there and they'll be notified that the, uh, a phone call was placed to emergency services from this room so that when emergency staff show up, they can be directed on how to get there. Up in Alcorn, if you don't know that you need a special key to take the elevator to the third floor, you're hunting around looking for the elevator key. Um, the responsibility of the, the building, uh, almost the building custodian, not necessarily from buildings and grounds, but who's in charge of the building and knows where the you know, resources are would be identified and be able to work with the uh, emergency services to get the proper location. And those, those are things that we're looking at implementing. Uh, we're lucky enough where we have the Everbridge solution. They have a appliance called Red Sky that does this uh, notifications coordination so that basically when 911's call, of course, uh, emergency <clears throat> services are notified, but also a message would come up on those dis uh, displays that you would designate in each building that says, okay, 911 was just called from room 311 and emergency services are coming. So there's a lot of benefit and again, looking to make quicker, better response and appropriate response to the locations. Um, the last part of our process for 2024 is to refresh the technology for the teachers. There's over 700 devices that we're going to be replacing and that is also in, the, uh, in our budget. So the budget breakdown is made up of 
um, $919,000 in salaries, uh, $313,000 in benefits. Prior to, <coughs> actually after this slide has been made, in, if we go forward with that reorganization, it would be a reduction to salaries and benefits of approximately $48,000 by combining those positions and having a part-time contract specialist, it will allow us to uh, reduce the salary and benefits budget by 48,000. Professional and technical services is 50% of our budget. These are all the services that we have for the, uh, for the infrastructure, for software, maintenance, um, all the different systems that we have throughout, throughout the town and schools. Um, our Microsoft Office licensing, uh, that's really the largest portion where we've moved our services to the cloud. It's taken it from personnel services and on-site hardware or technical equipment and have moved it to our professional technical services. Uh, other purchase services are our communications, our windstream telephone lines, our cell phones, our internet connections that we have, and we have four of them. We have one at JFK, one at Phil High, one at the police department, and one at the library. We take advantage of the high school and uh, JFK locations for the education because we apply for E-rate, which were uh, provided 60% discount on those services. So those services would typically be uh, almost $100,000 a year, and we're getting them for uh, $40,000. Technology equipment are the leases. We have leases on uh, school administration devices, teachers' devices, and also town and public safety devices. So all the computers, all the laptops, desktops, all those computers that are on that three-year refresh cycle fall within that, as well as our printing program. So our, our lease printers, and we pay per, per click on our printers, is all part of that 718000 our ETV operations is uh, 58311 for a total budget of $4.8 million, of which, as I said, re is reduced by $48,000. Now, that roughly equates to about 3.1% of the total town budget. And we are in every single department, every single part of the organization. Education, public safety, municipality. There isn't a person that doesn't use some sort of technology, whether it be phone, cell, computer, uh, throughout the organization. And we do it at basically 3% of the total budget. As you can see, our expenses, our major categories, 50% is in, as I said, for the uh, uh, tech services. 27% um, is in salaries and benefits. That's pretty unique for most organizations and industries where 27% of the budget is uh, salary and benefits. 16% of the budget is our tech equipment. So the services that are utilized for that tech equipment. And then the last remaining 7% is our communications that allows everything to communicate and provide external and internal resources to the technology that we provide. Our changes from 2023, the big areas are, it's 516,000 over the 2023 annual budget. 124,000 of that is in the technology leases. They've, they've, they've been delayed for two and one year, uh, respectively. Therefore, the town's increase is 47,000, and the teacher's lease will be 77,000. We had an increase of services of 392,000. 209,000 of that is from 36 new uh, requests from departments throughout the town for technology services, adding uh, modules, adding systems that will help improve and, and uh, gain efficiencies within the departments. We've added 1,250 ports to our infrastructure as a service, the network infrastructure as a service, and that added $112,000. Because of the, this, the increase in the number of ports, I renegotiated the rates per port that were at 987 with our vendor to uh, 599. So we reduced it probably 
um, because of the volume increase. <coughs> Our Microsoft licensing, this was what the, the increase that I was speaking of earlier where we're moving now the servers to the cloud and for our Azure cloud services, uh, for some of our key um, infrastructure servers, that, so like where people log in, it keeps track of their accesses and things, those will be, be being moved to the cloud. Some of the things that we will keep locally um, will be those that are CGIS required and that have to stay on site for, the, uh, for any of the public safety information. Um, and then we have an additional 21,000 uh, cybersecurity enhancements. We're really starting to expand services over at the Annex. Um, we're also expanding services uh, for the students where we actually, we have to protect the, the iPads that they bring home for internet. So when they access internet on those iPads at their home, they're actually coming through our filtering uh, so that we can ensure that they're not getting to inappropriate sites. And we, we have full tracking of where um, they go and, and how long they spend there. So a lot of times that will help uh, down the road as we start looking at some of the social services needs and some of the indices of maybe it may be able to pick up on um, any type of bullying based upon some of the access. So there's large capabilities with this data gathering that, we, that we're doing. Uh, just as a snapshot for the fiscal year of 2023, up through uh, March, we have over 12,500 devices. I was corrected this morning when I shared that with our team. They said, no, it's a greatly approaching 14,000. That, that's an old slide. I said, okay, thank you very much. But it's greatly increased from where we started. I mean, where we originally started, it was roughly 400 network devices. And the expansion has really taken off through our organization. We've uh, completed 4,176 requests. It's about 15, 16 requests that come in a day. And we, our average turnaround is, is usually between one, uh, one day and two days tops. Um, if it's a new service request, that takes longer because we have to do research and it's kind of new to our environment. So that we give that two weeks. Um, number of guests, Wi-Fi access up through March was 29,707. And a lot of that comes from students. They have uh, smart watches. They'll have their own personal phones. They'll have personal tracking devices. So it really adds a tremendous amount of workload to our, our support structure. Um, website hits, uh, over a million for the, uh, you know, on our town website. And interesting enough, we're looking at um, some AI processes that will integrate with our website and the search mechanisms on them are, was mind boggling. They did a demonstration yesterday for us where they were looking at, um, they asked us, put, tell us what to look for. And uh, our network manager, Carl, he said, bulky waste, what, you know, what do I need to know about bulky waste? Well, sure enough, it came up with the date that the bulky waste was available what you can bring, and it also provided what you can't bring, but it will cost you $20 if you bring it to the transfer station. And this was all from a single um, look of, of bulky waste, whereas it takes, combines all the information that's on our dedicated website and puts it towards that. So if there's any mention of either the bulky waste or any of the items that are in, listed in that description, it'll give you further details. So we're looking at possibly doing that even for our uh, phone system with the uh, integrated voice response so that somebody calls up and says, you know, I want to, who do I talk to about garbage pickup? It'll direct them right to the proper number and area that we, we assign to it. So the AI, you know, is, I know a lot of people have fears about it coming in, but it truly will help reduce the number of calls that people will have to pick up because it'll make our website much more user friendly and it integrates it even with somebody calling in and asking questions. It'll look up the answers and respond in a voice similar to like Siri or Alexa on the, on the phone call. So it's, I mean, we have some great technology that's, uh, that's on the forefront of coming in. And our favorite ETV filming. We have hit over the 1,000-hour hour mark by the end of March. 
and uh, you know our great staff that records uh, scheduled and unscheduled events. They they knock it out of the park when they do it, and uh, it's it's very much appreciated. So thank you for your support. I'm glad to entertain any questions. <laughs> Okay, th thank you, uh, Mr. Russell. Um, questions from anybody? Uh, Councilor Mangini. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate sure. the explanation and your presentation. Very, very good. Um, <coughs> just one question that I have. Sure. I noticed in your handout, yep. you've got desktop engineer vacant and network administrator vacant. I know you went over some of the information, but I want to clarify. So I understand better. Are we looking to not fill um, both of those positions? Network has two. Correct. And the desktop has one. So are we looking to just not fill them? We're looking to fill the desktop role and the network. The network role is part of our succession planning. We want to get somebody in so that we have the ne a network administrator now that's learning to be able to take over for the network manager when he does retire. And that's a very important cog of our, of our uh, organization is to have the network manager. That, really, that is really our security officer in, for the network and infrastructure. So Jason, who's the existing network <coughs> administrator, is really making great strides in that. He also has other responsibilities for servers and the Microsoft Office area and a lot of the applications. That's the position I'm trying to bring another body in for so that that can be transitioned when the ultimate you know time happens that the network manager will retire. Then we'll be back to two FTEs in the network services. So that's why you have two listed in the network? Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yes, Councilor <clears throat> Finger. Well, thanks, Paul, for everything. Uh, you know, like, really, really, admire all your staff. They've helped me out quite a bit at the transfer station. I mean, they're phenomenal. I've met a lot of the people there, and they're very dedicated to their job, and it's really, really important that we understand just how important it is to have your department in this town. Question I got, two questions I got for you is, one, when you say about moving the servers to the uh, cloud, yeah. is that a greater risk of any type of uh, hacking in, in, up in the cloud for that? So it's actually... It has because it's going to the Microsoft. It's a great question because right, you're thinking of cloning up there. But we're in dedicated uh, cloud services, so it's not part of the. It's not part of Google. It's not part of uh, um, AWS. Okay. The Amazon. It's actually secured, but it's our data that's part of it, and we'll share it with other municipalities because they have it carved out for municipal and public safety. They have it carved out for education, and then they have it carved out for. A banking industry. The actual federal government utilizes the Azure cloud services for a lot of their uh, work as well. And it's provided more secure than, as we've heard over the you know, last few weeks, the, uh, the violation that happened with the, the feds. And that was on site. Okay. Yeah. So the second question I got is um, the fire department. So I understand from the past, you guys have worked with North Thompson or something like that. Was yeah. There. So is, so are they contributing anything to your, your department? The funding, Did yes, that? yep. So we, we send out contract. We had four, uh, Enfield Fire Department went on their own with an outside agency, but we still provide support to Shaker Pines, Thompsonville, and Hazardville. And we charge them per device per month. Uh, so we, we have the cost of the lease, and then we also charge them with the port fees and the licensing fees that around all those, uh, uh, products that they use. We also charge them for calls. Uh, they're they're given five calls a month, mm -hmm. and then then we start charging additional time for resources going out there. We recently co uh, converted them from an older firehouse solution to the new ESO cloud based solution. So we, we've been keeping um, our fire departments up, up to date with us. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate sure, it. Sure. Hey, thank you, Con Councilor Fisner. Um, the reorg, when do you plan on having that happen? That July 1st. So July 1st. So the figures that we see in the book are actually more than last year, but you're saying it's going to reduce Correct. Salaries? It would be under 40. It's just not under, it's not in our books right now. Correct. Okay. Yep. And the second question I have is I remember probably several months ago, we as a council purchased software 
that was going to do pretty much what you're just saying the IA does. That if somebody went in and Googled something on the town website, they could pull up off of a word. Does anybody else recall doing that? Was, that was some of the stuff that came through. That was Civic Pro. Civic, yeah. yeah. Civic okay. Pro. Civic so Pro. how does that differ from this IA? Because it sounds really similar that you put a word in and everything comes up. So the, the difference between it would be it's also integrated with our phone system. So if somebody asks a question of a, uh, IVR, which is the integrated voice response. So if you say you called it in and said um, there's a street light out, it'll prompt you through asking you what street are you on, do you, does it have the poll number, um, what's the condition of it, and then what it does is actually tra transactionally fills all that information in our C-Click Fix module. So this is the C-Click Fix? It would be part of, it would integrate with C-Click Fix. Okay. Would, I'm just it, looking to just make sure we're not spending We're not money. double, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that, I mean, because it sounds very similar to what yep. we said yes to for the website, and then this doing the same thing. So the website side is actually building that information that the uh, AI will be getting from. So we still have to provide the information in there. Okay. And I know Steph is doing a lot of work getting that um, streamlined and and more. They, she's been working on getting it more resident like for verbiage as opposed to municipal code. Yeah, so we did two. One was Civic Pro and the other one was Civic Plus or some, something. And one was specific to like agenda meetings and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was website in general. That's okay. Civic right? Clerk. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, yeah. I, just, I think. I, they yes. just sounded similar, so I was just trying to make sure we weren't paying for something twice. That's all. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. No, that was great. No, it, it, absolutely. I won't bring up the, the IVR is always a little bit, you know, uh, with folks. I'm telling you, I don't know. I, whenever you call someone, you get bumped around. It's it's terrible. I'm just telling you. Uh, we do what we prepared today. Since you brought it up, to when folks get lost in the system. Yes, there's always there's always a zero out. I think it's one of the most frustrating to say. I, I, when I call and I get, it's the most. I just give me zero. Let me go to somebody. Mm -hmm. I'd rather pay for a human being than to go to IVR. I'll be honest with you, if okay. we can do it. Just saying. But anyway, I'm sorry, good to see you, Paul. How you doing? Same question. Um, you brought up IVR. Um, the 11 current listed in your budget, you're saying you currently have 11 people, you don't have you I have 11, 11 people budgeted. Budget, but how many people you currently are working? Right now, we're down to nine. So, so where, are the, where is the money going for that other two currently in your budget? So if it's if it's not for folks who are actually working, it, so it's it's in the budget. We just haven't spent it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So for, that, for fiscal that year twenty three. Before we get yeah, before we get to twenty three. Correct. Because my, my only concern so is with the in, or all the the increases that are in your budget are they already been negotiated or is this projecting what you want to pay for next year? Projecting. Projecting. Got yeah. it. Thank you. And the, the desk the help test help desk coordinator. Yes. So, so just curious, what I want to make sure I understand what was different. You, I think you explained it earlier. Okay. We what exactly is that person going to do? So right now, the service desk coordinator yep. is responsible for incident and problem management, and then for we, for the town for the town school, okay, yep, yep, the yep. whole infrastructure, and then we have a technical project coordinator who's responsible for project and change management. <clears throat> By introducing the modules. <clears throat> the service desk coordinator will be able to assume the responsibilities of technical of the project management and the change management as well as um, managing the incident and problems and it's a help desk for the employees not for right just speaking not for someone calling in a residence right Correct. right yep okay yep. thank you hey, curious do we have storage limits so if folks are storing things are there you know i mean in, i don't know whatever the storing information yep. Do, they, do we do they have limits? And if they go over the limits, how do we handle it? So there is no current limits right now, and we're also because we're a municipality, we're set at um, for full archive. So we have. So okay, so the the system doesn't we can okay. Yep. Which is a benefit because right when we had it on site, we used to have to pay for more. Right. And that we, was my we would send out the you know the the pleading letter yeah. saying. Hey, you know, we're approaching critical mass. Can you delete? Yeah. So we don't have files. to do that any, So is that because of the cloud or is it just a, right? It's because of the cloud. That would lead to me. At some point, right, my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, when we go to the cloud, it's cheaper. Correct. 
So when will we see that in your action line on your budget? I know you said we're not there yet, but, right. you're, but the technical services got up 16% over the last few years, right. actually 30% since 21, which is fine, but there should be something where now the budget starts flatlining. So where we'll, where we, we'll start seeing that is on the tech equipment side, we won't have to purchase right. servers and that anymore. So down to the technical equipment that went up, you're saying before laptops and right. edge devices, our infrastructure servers, we won't have to, we won't be looking for four when or five hundred thousand. When should we see that? That should be next year. I mean, there should be something we to have. have yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, our last one is we have the last set of servers as part of the tech lease, and that's thirty six thousand. So for next year, we probably see a reduction of twenty thousand because okay. we'll still need to keep something. All right, that's one I know. The benefits of going to cloud. And Doug's yeah. right. It actually is. It's technically more secure. Not that yeah. anything's 100 percent secure, right. but and the also the thing is supposed to save money too. Right. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I appreciate the answer. And the other big savings that we don't have a we don't have a good way of calculating. We can do estimates. Is electricity. Right. Cooling. Right. Um, you know that we can. We've been reducing the load of the size of the generators and the UPSs that we need to bring in, so they're much smaller, less expensive. So how, last question, appreciate the answer, right? Next gen, are we, if everything will go well, how did that next, we're completely? We're completely implemented, it's off and running. Um, we, part of the lease is we had all new uh, laptops installed in for the, for the uh, police cruisers. So even when the new ones come in, we've got them ready. It built three ready years? Built. Correct. Okay, you, because what was four, you mentioned earlier four years. Four, year, four years is where we're at right now with our existing equipment because of the and so the new the supply will be store. Yes. Perfect. Good. Yeah. Because I, I don't think there's many. At uh, four years, an old isn't it right? I, I appreciate. It's actually I even heard two is what most people are. Yep. Yeah. You know, and how often? The last question. Sorry. On the telephone system. When's the last time we went to bid? And do we go to bid often to get a better yeah, deal? As, there? as a matter of fact, we just did. Um, we were replacing Windstream with Granite, and we're saving. A little over five hundred dollars a month. That's great. Yeah, oh, you mentioned that. I'm sorry, right? Because those those deals, we, if you do it more often, you actually get so, a pretty good deal. Yeah. So we typically we do a three year deal because it gives you a good starting point. But in our contracts, we also have the ability to cancel with ninety days notice. Got it. Perfect. Thank you very much for your answers. Yeah. Uh, Paul, I have a couple of questions. A lot of them have already been answered. Uh, this one just goes to uh, the tech services. Is, is there any, uh, uh, you know, based off of your uh, your figures here, is, just, is there any outsourcing that goes out with any of the tech ser services? No, no, the, it's, and, and it's done is, mostly in-house, and we do a lot of it remotely because of the uh, tools that we put in place. We used to have five technicians, um, and we're able to reduce that based upon the number of remote supplies that we could, remote capabilities that we can do. Okay. All right, because I'm I'm just looking at the increase from you know like from 2021 up to 2024, uh, you know it's like a 500 almost a half million dollars. So the other aspect that we yeah. we did start including from that were all the departmental systems yeah. we started bringing in under uh, under IT so that they were all the IT. so we had there was IT costs that were distributed across police, uh, DPW. And other organ other parts of our Which organization. So now it comes all under IT, okay. and that's where that contracts module really helps out. Is that we're going to be able to manage and know when it's time for renewals, when we can start looking at renegotiating, getting ready, looking for new bids and suppliers for services, um, all based upon the terms and conditions of the contracts. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate that, Councilor Pis. I, I just have a map. I'm just trying to. The, the two positions are they listed? Because these two numbers don't match. The salaries that are in our book and the salaries that you have here yep. aren't the same. So the proposed salary for 2024 is different in the book than we have on here. So is this without two positions and this is with two positions? The 919? Yeah. The 919 includes the two positions. It includes it. Yes. And we're removing half of a position. Because uh, we're going to have a person go from full time okay. to part time. So it's, this is the number we're working with. Yes. And this would be forty eight thousand less. Less. Okay. So th these numbers are wrong that are in this book. Correct. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure I'm, yes. I'm reading it right. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, these were all recent um, okay. no, I'm good. findings. And then also, right before I got here, I received notice from E-Rate that we are eligible and will be receiving $120,000 credit that will be applying to the tech services. Nice. All right. Okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. For next year? For 2024. Paul, just, again, if you're, is there any benefit at some point where if the town has such a strong network where we can actually lease it out to the residents or to businesses? I, I know there's yeah. risk, but I'm saying... Is that any thought as we move? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we've, uh, we've had uh, Go Net Speed engage with us saying, look, if we kind of pull fiber around right, your you area, volume up, right? we use you and you use us. And I'm like, I'm all ears. You know, let no, I'm just curious. I, I've heard around the country some of that happening. I yep. don't know how to so there's, extent. So there's a lot, lot of towns that have done fiber to the premise. Yep. And they just... So back in 2014, we actually evaluated doing that with uh, sci-fi networks. And where they come in, they kind of front load the pay. And then with the reimbursement that they get from services to the, um, to the residents, um, it would pay off our debt. And they estimate like five right. to six yeah. years. Yeah, right. It's not and, then we, and then we could start getting impossible revenue from it. Correct. And it's actually... I've heard it's as strong. I mean, again, I'm not a network guy. Oh, it is. That's what I've heard, right? Oh, yeah. and it's, you know, a lot what of... If we ever thought of doing that, is that something that's long, very mm -hmm. long-term, doable, something... It's very doable. Okay. And it's typically about a 18 to 24-month completion. And it's very similar to what the same process that GoNetSpeed's doing now. They're looking for populous areas where right. they can get in and they can get big bang for their drop. So respectfully, at some point, maybe the next year, we'd love to have you come to a presentation if it's doable. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just my, yeah. I'll be glad to yeah. uh, talk and have GoNetSpeed come in. And I, I believe, um, you know, I know we're looking for uh, providers for the 4th of <laughs> July. They may be a perfect client. And I've heard, you know, there's been some, like there, I know there's always some, <coughs> there's always a spot somewhere where there's not as strong as it yeah. was in other areas. It's, not a bad idea. If we and I mean, the, the speed, and I've, I've actually talked to a resident who has GoNet speed and uh, the performance. I've heard shattering. it. I, yeah, I've heard so. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. It's happening over the country. There's other areas yeah. in the country already doing it. So I'm yeah. just. Yeah, yeah we, have, we have good pockets yeah. throughout the town right now that has that experience. No, appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. I'm done with my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Greatly appreciate it. And thank you for the updated information that you sent to us. Okay. Great. Thank you. And like I said, we're constantly looking at refining it, so bringing it down. Hopefully, you know, I think we've provided the worst case scenario, but we're constantly working at seeing how we can bring that down. All right. Well, th thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. All right. Next, uh, Chief Fox. Yes, Welcome. sir. Thank you. It'll take uh, 30 seconds to set up. Hey, yo, right hand, left hand, man, let's go. We got backup. We're down here. You're in the backup. Okay. Even though you're referring to us. Practical. I met Officer O'Connor for that shot. Oh, yeah. Nice guy. Yeah, really nice guy from Berlin. That was a good pickup. Yeah, that was. Yeah, we can take a survey. He likes it because he likes the department. He's a full of reading, but he's full of reading. 
Well, well, but he did his homework, though. He, he wanted to know what the problem was. He lived in Bristol, now he just moved to Angle. He just moved to Angle. Look, that's a requirement. Um, no, Charles. Charles. Is he? Yeah. I've talked to him before. So, this yeah. is the time. Real nice guy, real efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Like you guys I love it when we score a bit today. Yeah. Yeah. Someone else. Yeah. 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 So, we're on day. So, we're stopping. So, it's not a serious contribution. It's our. They take what we share. Okay. I always have a thing to ask them. We're still alive. Yes. Okay, excuse me guys, we're gonna we're gonna get going. Uh, welcome G Fox and uh, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you as always for the chance to join you. Uh, it continues to be my pleasure to serve as your chief of police and to provide supervision at the Enfield Police Department. The uh, following, I hope you find it uh, worthwhile, I hope you find it illuminating. I tried to uh, I've tried to surmise some of the subject areas that I thought would be of interest to you. I have supporting documentation for additional areas should they come up in the course of our time together. And certainly, as always, very happy to answer any questions during the presentation or at the end as you should see fit. I thought it appropriate to open with an overview of current department staffing, where we are, where we are in relation to uh, last year, and where I expect that we will go in the future. Uh, I'm pleased to tell you that we are always improving. I'm pleased to tell you that I think that we have amongst the best men and women I've ever worked with. Uh, I'm not particularly happy to tell you that we continue to you know, push against the, the tide in terms of getting to that number of 100 officers. From a budget perspective, we uh, are currently slotted for 100 sworn officers in the budget that is before you. However, 97 of those positions are budget funded. There was an awareness last year that because it seems virtually impossible for me to ever get to that figure of 100, I do think I hit it in January of this year. Uh, I went to my roll calls and said to them, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, nobody quit, nobody resigned, nobody retired, nobody died, we're keeping what we have right now. And while they took it with a good sense of humor, uh, obviously I can't hold them to any of those. 100 sworn, 97 of those positions are budget-funded. And that results effectively in about a $300,000 $300, uh, on paper budget savings to you. Uh, I have those three openings. Uh, as Mr. Belinda and I were just chatting, and you may have heard, I'm a little frustrated to tell you that number is now four. I'm sure you know Officer Jake Ryan. Officer Jake Ryan came in to see me today along with Captain Golden and announced that he's been hired as an ATF agent. So you should be, and I know you are, very pleased and very proud that you, uh, that you provide oversight to a department that roots people to the FBI, that roots them to the DEA, that roots them to the ATF, that roots them to the Massachusetts State Police and the Connecticut State Police. That speaks volumes, I believe, about the caliber of our department. Having said that, it is a punch in the gut when I lose someone, particularly someone of Jake's caliber, 10 years in the department, loved by the community, a great choice as a CPO, but I can't stand in their way. I thought it disingenuous to drop the 97 to 96 because he's with me for two more months, but that is the growth for employees and that is the turnover that we do see within the agency. Not counting Jake and standing at 97. As you know, 97 never really means 97. I have 10 other absences. One is a workers' compensation injury. Uh, it is certainly not a uh, milking it. Uh, it's a hardworking employee who's been out after surgery for, a, and he's been out for an extended period. Uh, we do think we're going to get him back sooner rather than later, at least in a light duty capacity. Uh, I have one light duty employee. It is a pregnancy. Uh, that, as you know, is protected, and it should be by federal and state law. Uh, so that employee is not a line employee for me, even though she does do good work. And I have eight employees that are either in the training academy or the FTO program. Uh, I don't want, and you don't want, employees that don't have six months at the training academy and four months in the FTO program, but that spin-up time is considerable. Um, so when I deduct one plus one plus eight plus the three from the original 97, I'm operating right now at about 86. And that is about our norm. I specifically recall the question last year from the deputy mayor. If you got to 100, would the overtime go down? And the answer was yes. The rub is getting to 100. Uh, so the overtime is about what the overtime was because the staffing remains about the same. The upcoming budget before you maintains the request for 100 sworn with 97 budget funded, not asking to go up and hoping not to go down. I have been asked separately by a few of you 
where are we if we took a look at the size of our population? And I went to about the best source that I could find for a national standard and a, na and a national rubric. The FBI provides data to us that tells us the national rate of sworn law enforcement is 2.4 per 1,000. So if I multiply that by the last reported census estimate for Enfield, your number, and let me be clear, I'm not asking for it, but your number would be 107.1984 police officers. I'm not asking for 7.1984, but I would offer this to you as against any community pushback, resident concern, constituent concern that you might get that the department is overstaffed. The department's at 100, but the national average is arguably 107.1984. Uh, and remember, it's not really 97 and it's not really 100 because of that lesser staffing number. You've seen the next couple of slides before, but I thought it was important to remind you uh, what are they doing all day. 2022, calendar year 2022, the department took 38,404 calls for service. Some are very short, some are very long. Some take a matter of minutes, some take a matter of days. That's 105.2 calls for service daily. Department personnel also make uh, arrests or have arrests of one, uh, 1,705 arrests over the course of the year. That is 4.67 uh, daily. And additionally, while I did not make a slide out of this, you'll also remember uh, one of the more recent times we were together, we were talking about Abbey Road, we were talking about traffic enforcement concerns. Calendar year 2022 also saw a total of 6,337 motor vehicle stops. That equates to 17.36 motor vehicle stops per day. Uh, I, I'm not representing in any way that any of you are saying this, but to the extent that there would ever be a community concern that I have a ready reserve of officers sitting at the PD waiting to deploy, that's not the case. The officers are, are regularly going from call to call to call to call to call. Are there times where they're caught up? Sure, there are times where they're caught up. Are there times where we're stacking calls in the queue and dispatch is triaging based on what's the most pressing? Yeah, that happens as well. And when that occurs, it's life safety, uh, protect the community, enforce the law, and maintain public order in terms of our priorities. In terms of other department functions, and I'll actually go a little bit out of order here, uh, dropping to the orange on the bottom of this slide, I have no notable operational budget increases as to any of the following functions. 15 dispatch positions, 15 positions are currently filled. There's a formula, right? There's a target staffing level, there's a rubric for what we need to maintain three dispatchers on days, three dispatchers, dispatchers on eaves, and two on mids over the course of 24-7 in order to absorb the a time off that they're entitled to, and that number is 15. I'm pleased to tell you we are at 15. There was a point where we were hemorrhaging some dispatchers, and you folks made what I thought and I appreciate uh, was a very uh, uh, beneficial and a magnanimous uh, decision uh, with people here on board and with Mr. Melinda's help to say we're losing people to other agencies because we weren't competitive, and I'm pleased to tell you that we're at 15, and I think we're reasonably competitive. Five of six positions in the records unit are filled. The sixth has been identified and will be onboarded soon. I have one full-time and one part-time animal control officer. Uh, those positions are filled for a couple of years now. I have been unable to fill two part-time ACO positions. Uh, it's a difficult job. Um, I don't know that it's a career path for some folks. Um, the pay is okay, uh, perhaps not outstanding, uh, and I have two part-time positions, at least one of which I would really want. Uh, and then the other one, which you approved dating back to Mr. Bromson's time with us, was as a result of community concerns, constituents that were calling you and saying there are periods in the course of the month where I can't get an ACO. And he called me, and I said, that caller is right. Because with one full-time and two part-times, I can't cover 24-7. One full-time and three part-times, I can. Right now, I have one plus one, um, and that's where we stand. Uh, and I'm not asking for anything more than that. The difficulty is really the marketplace and supply and demand. All of those individuals are supervised, uh, and we have a civilian service personnel, per, 
All civilian service personnel are supervised by Steve Hall. He is our civilian services manager. He doubles as the town's emergency management director. He does get a stipend for that. That is off uh, budget. There's, uh, there's money that comes for that from the state. In terms of our operational budget, which is really what I hold myself uh, most responsible for to you, because you rightly hold me responsible for it, uh, salary, benefits, and fringe, I'm certainly always happy to talk about those, uh, but there's not, a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of wiggle room there. In terms of the operational budget, where were we last year? Where are we this year? We go through the budget. Captain Golden is rather my lead in the budget, and he convenes meetings, and I go to the meetings, and Captain Kazalowskis joins, and he brings all the budget people together, and he says to them, what do you need, and what can we take out? Added to this year's budget and the operational side of the house, and I will be detailing these in the next couple of slides, is a total of $122,585 added to the operational side of the budget. We were able to remove $59,999. You don't know how hard I worked to find an extra dollar because 60 sounded so much better than $59,999. Uh, but that was, that was um, grants that we were able to find. We were able to fund a dog that I thought I was going to be at in front of you this year asking for. We were able to off-budget some canine expenses. Uh, Captain Kazalowskis was able to save us a considerable amount of money on our, uh, on our drug testing contract for the year. I was able to save us some money by finding a different vendor for our psychological testing for this year. Some items that are one-off expenses drop off the budget. If it helps you to think about it, because it certainly helps me to think about it, 122,585 minus 59,999 is a net increase to the operational side of the budget. Happy to talk about salary and benefits, but obviously those are things that I do not directly control. 62,586 is the add on the operational side. And this is where it would go. And I describe it, uh, and I don't want it to come off like smart mouth. But I would describe it for you as these are asks that are without much wiggle room. The first four items that you see uh, merit a moment's explanation. It is very expensive to onboard a new employee. New employees require a cost for the post-basic training academy program. When we send them to Meriden, or Hartford, or Waterbury, or wherever we're going to send them to, New Britain, we pay for that. There was a point in the course of my law enforcement career where that was a state function, and it was free. Back in the Malloy era, the state budget was extraordinarily lean, and that became a, there's a tuition, and you're going to pay for that. The current year's budget has money in it for us to onboard six new employees. So said another way, when I was in front of you last year, I said to you, I need money for six new employees, and here are the costs for those six employees. It's going to be the training academy in Meriden or elsewhere. It's going to be the mandatory drug testing and medical evaluation for new hires. It's going to be the basic academy uniform. It's going to be all the required academy gear. It's going to be the new employee uniform and all new equipment. We had money in the budget. Thank you to onboard six new employees. This year, we have hired, drum roll please, 11 new employees. So every time I went above six, that was added money. And I would go to Captain Golden, and I would go to Captain Kazalowskis, and I would say, you got to scrape it from somewhere. I need to hire these new employees. So there were other accounts that ran deficient. There was me coming in front of you saying, I need to do some budget transfers, and you understood why. Six to nine is where we're asking to go in the next year. So I'm at six. We've hired 11, and it's May 4th. I've got about two months to go, and I'd like to find more employees to hire. What I'm asking for in the upcoming year is to run that number for the next budget from six to nine. We know, and I had a conversation with the captains today sort of offline, I know of at least five employees that are in process right now to either retire or to go to other jobs or they're pursuing other opportunities. That's a compliment to their caliber. That's a compliment to your agency. But every time I lose one, I gotta bring somebody else on board. I'm asking from six to nine 
if I have money, and, but, but those again are the ones I know about, right? I don't know that every employee is coming to me and telling me they have an application that's outbound to some other federal, state, or, or local law enforcement agency. Those first four numbers are driven by that request. The cost of our mandatory in-service training program, that's the 65 hours every three years, that has gone up. The cost of the third day of training for the department members who are EMTs, that's the highest level of medical training that our officers would have, uh, the cost of the third day, which is hands-on, real-time, live, in the emergency room at Hartford Hospital, that cost has gone up. Uh, there is some mandatory training for records unit personnel. It's only $1,000, but I, don't, I have no wiggle room on that. Live scan is the fingerprint system. The state gives us the live scan machine for free. They do not maintain the live scan automated fingerprint system for us. There are expenses that we are going to occur above and beyond what is currently budgeted for that system. The Joint Operations Center has equipment that is starting to fail. We're asking for an increase in that line on item of $5,000 because equipment is starting to fail. It just, it, it, it's, it's reached the end of its serviceable life. Uh, the quartermaster is Officer Felici, uh, and he's outbound, and it's Officer Roach, and he's inbound into that job. The quartermaster is the function in the agency that provides all the gear and all the equipment that isn't unique to the individual officer. So think about Narcan in the car. Think about medical supplies. Think about tourniquets. Think about the fire extinguishers. Think about everything that's not assigned to an individual that has to come out of quartermaster. And that unit is telling me that what he has for funding is not going to be adequate going into the next year. Officer Michael Roscoe is one of the snipers on our tactical team. Uh, the Crest team, as you know, is give a little, get a lot. Uh, we send people out of town when Manchester and Windsor and Bloomfield needs them. But when I need a small army of people, I call them the hot, hot boys, right? When I need them, they come to town. And they do things that are beyond the, the level of capability of a normal patrol officer. Officer Roscoe is a sniper on the team. So we're not talking about plunking at tin cans. Officer, right, Officer Roscoe has a sniper rifle that is about 10 years old. It now no longer, this is the phrase we use, it now no longer holds a zero. This is an individual in that God forbid situation that needs to be able to hit something about the size of a quarter from 100 yards out, from 150, from 200 yards out. He has a rifle that is about 10 years old. It needs to be replaced. Uh, tactical vests. All officers are issued, and this is the example, right? All officers are issued soft body armor that we wear under our uniforms on a day-to-day -day basis. This is handgun caliber body armor. There is a much heavier, much bulkier, you couldn't and wouldn't wear it on a day-to-day -day basis, rifle caliber body armor. That is present in the patrol vehicles. So if the act of aggressor in that God forbid category, I know it'll never happen here, said every town in America. If that active aggressor showed up at JFK or Enfield High School or the Enfield Town Hall, and we knew or remotely thought they were armed with a long gun, the officer on patrol would go into their trunk and they would grab that heavier rifle caliber ballistic armor. Our administrative personnel and our detectives do not have that caliber armor in their trunk. That's not acceptable, right? If they're the first one, they're expected to grab whatever they have and run to the sound of the gunshots. In the modern era, we should have rifle caliber or long gun tactical vests for administrative personnel as well. Finally, in terms of the not much wiggle room, we get our department cell phones for free. Officer Kretowick retired, uh, found a vendor, negotiated a contract, IT concurred and blessed on it. We are getting our cell phones for free. We are getting our service for free. However, at the end of the life expectancy of those contracts, we need to replace them. And now for the first year, we need to do that. I need to replace one third of the phones. Please know I'm getting service for free, but I need $5,000 in future years in order to maintain that arrangement. 
I thought it important to be extraordinarily candid with you, and I'm pleased to do so. There are some asks in the budget, and I feel like I can justify each and every one of these, but I do recognize that it is your job to reconcile competing interests, including folks that come before you and say, you can't raise taxes, I'm on a fixed income. So to the extent you said to me, where is there any fat whatsoever? I feel like I can justify these items, but before you grab something, if you had to, I would point you here. We have uh, a contract for an undercover car for Detective Chamberlain, who's assigned to the DEA task force, as you are aware. This contract allows Detective Chamberlain, through a vendor, to go and switch out the car that he is driving with this vendor as often as he wants to. And he does this not so he can drive a cooler ride. He, he does this because the type of work he does, if the car gets burned, if the car is known, if the car is identified, he can't come back with that car the next day. On a micro level, I have a couple of people in the Detective Bureau who are doing great work in drug cases locally here. You saw the email last week. We're up to about $100,000 in seizures, 41 pounds of marijuana, two guns, including one ghost gun, out of a house here in our town. What I do not have in the detective division, I do not have locally a soft undercover car that they can use. I have two vehicles that are in the back of the PD, and that is what we use. I won't get into great descriptions of them, but when those two get burned, I, ha I, I can't send my guys out in a Ford Taurus to do surveillance. I would like to get a second vehicle under that contract for local use for drug investigations, because just like you get calls about the Scantic, and just like you get calls about Francis Avenue, you get calls about drug dealing in my neighborhood, what are the police going to do about it? The air conditioning system is for the traffic bus, that's an ask. We got a new uh, F-150 marked vehicle. We got it under a grant. It was free as to us. I'd like to buy a bed cover for it so I can transport items without fear of weather issues. We use it to transport sawhorses. We use it to transport cones. But we use it to transport evidence as well. And if we're hauling the evidence back from a scene, I can't have that evidence get wet. Large screen monitor replacements, these are for places in the PD. Uh, they're not TV screens, they're large monitor screens. And we're asking for a modest increase to our confidential informant fund. CIs don't, they don't work for free. We've got we've to pay them for their um, services. I anticipated, um, long before I watched the video from last night, that there would be questions about overtime expenditures, and overtime is always a significant driver within my budget. Uh, I have a supplemental handout, should anyone want to see it, but I'm going to show you snapshots or screenshots of it in a minute. If you want to get down into the weeds, I brought copies. Please know that all overtime is tracked and categorized and requires supervisory approval. Please know that non-reimbursable department overtime is driven by a variety of factors and situations. The single largest factor is minimum shift staffing levels. There is a number that you need, that I need, that the community needs at a minimum to be safe on days and on eaves and on mids. And when we drop below that number for any of the multitude of military leave, pregnancy leave, sick days, vacation days, training days, when we drop below that number and, and the staffing that I have just about covers what we need, until there's a pregnancy, until there's a workers' comp absence, until somebody goes on vacation, when I drop below that number, what we say is that we're below minimum staffing levels. That is the most significant driver of overtime in our budget. Guarding prisoners at the hospital, we can't bring them to court when they're not medically sound. So if we can, we'll release them on a promise to appear, we'll release them on a non-surety bond, but if they're being held on a court-set bond, I can't change that. We had an individual that we took into our custody on Friday. Right. person went to Johnson Memorial. The person was guarded by an officer on overtime at Johnson Memorial until... Wednesday. 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 Court won't take them. Court won't court take won't them. them if they have medical problems and they leave them in our custody until they are cleared from the hospital. 
That's that's overtime money to guard a prisoner. If I, and if I could release them on a promise to appear, if I could release them on a non-surety bond, if they'd give me a pinky swear, a pinky swear, I'd release them. Court set bond. I don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. Court appearances under subpoena, overtime. A new state process this year has cost you a significant amount of money. The state rolled out this year what's called the Risk Protection Order or RPO process. You may have seen some of the, the, the coverage on this. Well-intentioned, absolutely. An individual who is not suitable to possess firearms because they've made that statement, because they're representing that they're a danger to themselves or the community or someone else. We don't stop them from getting a gun if they go to get one. We're doing paperwork that's the equivalent of a warrant in advance to preclude them from even trying to get a gun. This process is referred to as the Risk Protection Order or RPO process. It involves two officers serving as affiants, doing paperwork, and going to the court in Hartford where they sit and wait for a judge until there's a break in the judge's schedule. They go in and they swear, the judge signs it, and the person then goes into a database maintained by the state police that would preemptively preclude them from trying to get a gun or a permit, even though they don't have one right now. It's a preemptive step. And I get it in the big picture. The point here was when someone does something really bad, mass shooting, and people say, yeah, we saw it coming. And the community says, well, why didn't somebody do something about it? Connecticut said, we're going to do something about it. However, they rolled out this extremely clunky, cumbersome process. I'm happy to share with you the Chiefs of Police Association is working to limit this. And we have legislation, and we think it's going to pass. We think it's going to drop it down to one affiant, and we're, which will cut your costs in half. And we're trying to get it some degree of electronic. So you don't go and sit in front of the judge. But that right now is the legislative effort. You spent money on the RPO process this year. Mandatory training that cannot be scheduled during regular hours. I was at a training day all day yesterday. Captain Golden was at a training day all day the day before. We cost you nothing. We just have to do two days work the next day. But in my class was four or five patrol officers, and they were there because they had to get an hour of body-worn camera. They had to get two hours of crowd control. They had to get an hour of stop sticks training, state mandate. And to the extent those officers, and this is just representative of one half day on one occasion that the whole department has to get, those officers were not on patrol, mandatory training. Crest Metro Traffic, Powder Hollow State Park, we're coming up on the season. Thompsonville walking patrols, particularly Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, daytime, sometimes, warm weather. I want and you want that extra deterrent and deterrence down there. Search warrant executions, prisoner extradition, major crime, fatal serious injury accident investigations. Now remember the murder from last year occurred in the middle of the night. The phone rang at my house at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning and all the detectives came in. And when that happens, there's an overtime expense for those major call-outs. Field training officers, uh, supervisory staff meetings, I drop that down to three times per year. I feel I can be effective three times per year. It's a cost for you. So only three per year, but three per year. Uh, Town-wide celebrations, I've got an independent slide that's coming up on that in just a minute for you. Um, we had a significant presence at a number of town council meetings and board of ed meetings this year. Uh, we were happy to provide that, but that does come at a cost. What I have, if anyone wants to see it, and what's important to me here is that you know that we are not gin enough reasons for people to work overtime. In all candor, and I think this is generational, probably the junior third of my department and it's climbing. doesn't <coughs> want to work overtime. I know. So to the extent, and once again, I'm not saying you're saying this, but to the extent that anyone might perceive that we're creating overtime opportunities because people want to earn the overtime, we're forcing people to work a lot of overtime because they don't want to work it. It's actually a disincentive, if you will. But what you see before you, albeit a little hard to see, uh, I've got paper copies should anyone be so inclined. These are all the categories of all the overtime, and I won't go through all of them for you, uh, but it's considerable. I can justify every dollar that's spent. Supervisors sign off on every dollar that was spent. I believe it was Councillor Ludwig at one point within the last year, maybe a little more than that, that asked about this, and I had the handout ready to go. Um, it's not done willy-nilly. 
It's tracked, it's tracked with justification, and a boss has got to sign off on it. But if you're the evening shift officer who takes that late domestic at 10 o'clock and two people got arrested and somebody's getting held on bond and they're going to court in the morning, that report's got to be done. The evidence has got to be processed. The work has got to be in. And if you're staying until 2, I'm sorry you're staying until 2. I am very cautious in this subject area because I know that perhaps it may be a bit of uh, consternation for folks. But in terms of celebrations and the celebration line item, considerable on-duty patrol, traffic division, auxiliary, and where we can get them out-of-town agency personnel are committed to. The Jack-O-Lantern Festival, not so much. The Torchlight Parade, not so much. But certainly the 4th of July festivities, right? 4th of July festivities, we have bicycles, we have motorcycles, we have crest operators, and you're getting them at no cost. And that's the trade for when you have to send people out of town. Auxiliaries, on-duty personnel, traffic personnel, and CPOs do cover a substantial amount of your commitments to the jack-o'-lantern and to the uh, uh, and to the Christmas parade, department overtime department overtime hours expended for jack-o'-lantern and torchlight have not notably increased over the last few years. Uh, it's traffic posts. It's a couple of people providing some degree of omnipresence. They are consistent, uh, uh, consistent uh, overtime. Department expenditures. Oops. Department expenditures for the past year's 4th of July increased due to a consensus, due to a consensus within the administration of the PD, due to some discussions that I had with town administration, and I believe it was discussions that reached all of you as well. I know it included members of the 4th of July committee. There was a significant concern that had popped just a few days before our 4th of July festivities kicked off. And this is what they were, right? It was uh, Illinois. It was the parade that occurred on the 4th of July, um, seven dead and 48 wounded. And I'll tell you, I struggled with putting the picture in because I'm a firm believer that I do not want to memorialize and I, don't want, I do not want to um, uh, recognize individuals that are involved in this degree of carnage. But what we did this year was we put officers on rooftops for you. We put officers monitoring cameras that we have funded and that were, up, that were up and about on parade routes on Route 5, on the green, and we activated uh, the drones. We had the drones up as well, uh, and nothing happened. And would nothing have happened if I hadn't spent that? I'm not a gambler, and I, and I don't know that you are as well. It won't happen here, is what is said in every town in America. I have also included uh, within the budget conversations with Mr. Wilcox, Mr. Belinda, and the town manager. Uh, my four asks this year that are CIP related. Uh, I do understand that you've got to make some hard choices, but I want certainly from the police department perspective for you to have the information so you understand once again that our asks are not, they're not willy-nilly in nature. We are facing the final payment toward the town radio system this year. Uh, find comfort that next year that would be a found $778,000, but our last payment is $778,000. Uh, that could have been paid last year, but the decision was made to split that into a final uh, two-year breakout, so we extend it out by a year. Uh, I would also offer to you, I know I've said this to, to you before, please know this is not Rick's radio system. This is the town radio system. DPW is on it. EMS is on it, fire department is on it, PD is on it. It just happens to fall under my umbrella. So uh, don't, don't think that I'm feathering my bed here. 68,000 uh, for red dot pistol optics. Uh, we all remember the Bristol shooting. Uh, the state of the art optic to have for a handgun is what's referred to as a red dot. It looks almost like a, a red dot. It looks like a laser, but it's not projecting out. Most of our officers, including I, have it on our personally owned rifles as well. It's an upgrade. We've paid for it ourselves. Uh, you'll remember the officer that survived that shooting that you know, engaged in a pistol shot from 50 yards out uh, that hit the offender and ended that carnage while bleeding, while bleeding uh, having repeated an expletive recorded on his body-worn camera before he took that shot, uh, had a red dot uh, pistol had a red dot sight on his pistol. 
half a million, uh, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for ten vehicles. A car, and I'm going to explain that in more detail. A car is forty-four thousand plus thirty-one thousand for all the attendant equipment. One hundred eighty-five thousand for the town camera system. The system has been operational for five years. It's enjoyed great success. It was not funded last year. Let me tell you about the camera system first. The town camera system consists of approximately 18 poles, 24 data facilities, and about 100 cameras. It has been incredible. It has been invaluable since its inception four years ago to what we are able to do and how effective we are able to police. The phrase that we use now is to police smartly. I can't and you wouldn't, I wouldn't and you can't afford a cop on every corner. You got a cop on many corners now, and he, she, or it doesn't need health care. He, she, or it doesn't need a pension. Uh, you got a hundred of those cops out on those corners right now. We have identified the guilty. We have exonerated the innocent. We've solved cases that have otherwise likely been unsolvable, and we've witnessed in real time motor vehicle accidents and criminal behavior. There was what looked to be a near fatal motorcycle accident on the east part of town about two weeks ago. You might remember it. That could have, would have been a who's at fault. We had a little bit of this going on between the parties. We got it on camera. Uh, and I sent the link to the manager and the town manager. I'd make it available to you. It's an active investigation. I didn't think it appropriate to send it out mass email at the time that it occurred. Um, We've tied in housing authority cameras, BOE cameras, and cameras from other town departments for a, for a very wide net. Our system, your system, dating back to Brian Chakowsky saying, I'm on board, and Chris Bromson being early on at the helm when this was implemented, we identified this as a seven-year project, knowing that by the seventh year, we were going to need to start replace breaking equipment. The town did not fund year four last year, I understand. If the town does not fund year five this year, we will be two years behind. So we'll be in that situation almost akin to where the town was with cars a few years back. If you don't fund it in future years, you're behind, things are breaking, and honestly, you need to catch up in future years. If you can't, I get it. I'm just trying to lay out the options for you. I'll do whatever it is you say you can do. Here's further information on the vehicles because my God, he's back again asking for 10 cars. Ten vehicles are scheduled for replacement this year under the town's fleet vehicle replacement plan. That's not the RIC plan, that's the DPW plan. Under the town plan, vehicles should be removed from patrol when they reach five years or 100,000 miles. The ten vehicles that are identified are as old as nine years old with current average mileage of 98, 555.7. There will be a ripple effect because we'll take some cars and make them into what we call school cars. So they won't be on the line, but they'll still, they'll still serve some purpose. Some of those cars will come over here to other town departments, and some cars will go off to auction. That's a DPW type of decision. But I'd ask you to think about 98555, which is bumping up against the 100,000 miles with the following in mind. Ford's order window this is bringing us back to pandemic supply chain shortage issues, is expected to open in October. If we were able to get all of the cars in in October, we would expect delivery of those cars July, August 2024. If I extend out the anticipated mileage on those cars for another 14 or 15 months, those cars will then be at, on average, 129,805.7 miles. The very last thing that I would tell you about the cars, and ladies and gentlemen, I like you. I sincerely do, and I think you like me. So I will tell you I hesitated about doing this because I didn't want it to come off as snarky, but I thought it was a great visual if anyone is interested. The captain and the captain and I drove three of those cars here tonight. They are outside in the parking lot. If anyone would like to go for a ride, if anyone would like to see them, you are more than welcome to. I will tell you that I came over in a patrol car. It's a current line car. It has 147,000 miles on it. One of the captains came over in what we call an SRO car. So that's a line car, but it's used by the school resource officers effectively to go back and forth from the schools. It is certainly a less emergency vehicle, but still an emergency vehicle. 
That car has 134,000 miles on it. Torn, arm, torn center armrest, holes in the vehicle exterior, uh, filled from equipment reuse, damage to the driver's side. And the third car we brought over is what we would call an extra job car. It is still an emergency response vehicle. However, it goes out with officers to extra jobs, to overtime assignments, to roadway construction. It is a 2010 Crown Victoria. It is 13 years old, broken exterior lens, no siren, half the light bar is not working, and there is no air conditioning. I sincerely like you, and I think you're like me. Please understand I'm not trying to be snarky, but I thought it would have some value for you, if you wished, to understand, for me to at least endeavor to emphasize why it is we're asking for assistance with the vehicles. As always, it is my pleasure to be before you, and I'm available for any questions or concerns that might be on your mind. <clears throat> Thank you, Chief. Very Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, Um, thanks, Chief, and I am actually not going to ask you questions about overtime this year. I do have a couple of questions. Please. So the um, animal control officer, and I think that I was here when we tried to we when we funded that extra part time position because we thought it was important, and it's just never been filled. So two part question: one. Would it be more attractive if we did one full-time versus the two part-time? Is that even an option? Would that be helpful? And what else can we do to try to get that filled? Is it a pay? Is it a benefit? Is it a hours? What's, what's, what do you think the issue is? I do think it would be more effective to combine two part-times into one full-time. Mm -hmm. uh, it would increase the cost because now we're adding in fringe costs. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it would be more beneficial. Um, and I do think that the pay rate is um, slightly less. I would defer to Mr. Belinda if he wished to weigh in. But you know, part of this is also uh, it's the job market and it's the fact that jobs aren't getting filled. Um, it is a... Um, it is, a, it is a tough job. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think, I'm very comfortable on the first part, and I wish I knew the answer to the second part. I do think the part-time uh, number is one of the detriments to filling the position. So if we, would it be helpful to the town to have a full-time, another full-time animal control officer instead of two part-times? Is that even a thing that you would consider as something you would do? Yes, because I think what we would do then is we would have full-time coverage in the daytime. We'd have part-time coverage, full-time coverage on the evening shift. And then I'd use the part-timer. Uh, they're going to fill in on days off. You know, the, the rub really is that I need to have somebody there on the weekends as well. Right. Because the animals need to be tended to. Yeah. They need to be fed. They need to be watered. And that is why the part-time idea has worked up to this mm -hmm. point but I can't fill it as a part-time, so I'm bringing in the full-time wherever I can. I'm, I'm, I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul here. I do think it would be advantageous. Can you get us, when you have a chance then, the difference between what two part-timers would cost versus what the one full-timer would cost? I, would I can't imagine it's a very big difference, but if you could get us that, I would appreciate it. But there'd still be that. another part-timer. <clears throat> well, we have, there would be one. One part-timer. Yeah. So this interview someone. Um, my next question was on the EMTs. Now, not all police officers are, have the EMT certification, right? Correct. How many of ours do? Captain? Approximately 25. You'll remember uh, going back to a time that preceded me, you had a police department that ran the ambulance. That is mystifying to me. <laughs> Having said that, it worked for One you. One of them is here, sir. <laughs> um, so when the ambulance became an EMS function, you had a good number of department members that were still EMTs. Mm -hmm. That is not a requirement any longer. Right. Uh, most of the folks, including myself, are EMRs. That's the le next level down. Okay. But for the 25 that are EMTs, mm -hmm. uh, that's, an, that's a very valuable skill for them to maintain. Right. So for those 25, it's only 1,500, according to, like, if we have 25. That's the cost yeah. increase above and beyond what's okay. currently budgeted, yes. Okay. Um, and I did have... All right, I had questions on the vehicle replacement plan, and you did answer, I think, one. Remind me, because I don't remember off the top of my head, how many you asked for last year and how many we funded? Mr. Wilcox, can you help it all? 14 and 10. 
It was no, one. Last year we didn't was fund all ten. Ten. Yeah. Yeah. Last year we um, we funded an additional ten cruisers, ten. right? Yeah. We had funded fourteen, I think, two years prior, six the year prior to that, ten brought us up to thirty in the last three years. Ten keeps us on a rotating five year plan for yeah. they have about fifty uh, um, patrol and uh, detective vehicles. Okay, so under the vehicle replacement plan for this year, you would be slated to get another ten. Yeah, I was That's... led to. I was led to believe originally it was eleven, and we somehow it became ten. But I believe that the DPW original recommendation was eleven. Okay. So we're, we're close. It's okay. within one. And not including. Well, let's include this the school year coming up. How many would you be behind then if you got your ten? How, how many vehicles would we be behind in the last couple of years as far as replacing? I, I've, like I said, based on my analysis on it, I think they're they're up to speed on Okay. On the, so next year we would replace another 10. Okay. Then all 50 of those would have been replaced in the last five years. Okay. So if we don't fund all 10, you'll be under, for the, that five-year span, you'll Correct. be under. Okay. And, and that's not counting any cars that are involved in crashes that are totaled. Yeah. So 10 is 10 vehicles making it the entire year. If we lose any, then that also puts us behind. Okay. And the ones that go out to auction, um, which I know is a DPW thing, where does that money come back into? Whose budget? General fund, correct? General fund. That, that goes Close into... To you? No. Because, <laughs> you say, uh, uh, that actually goes into the CIP fund. Okay. Okay. And that money accumulates and occasionally then we come to you to appropriate it for purchase of yep. either equipment and or other vehicles things like that yeah. right okay uh, the same thing applies with tipper barrels uh, that money goes into another account in the cip fund and we reappropriate that occasionally for uh, the purchase of additional tipper barrels when those get destroyed we need to be okay. same thing with insurance claims correct Right, the insurance claims go into a separate fund, and, and yes, we can replace those vehicles. But like, if we lost a car for whatever reason, and an insurance payout came in, it would go to it would go to the general fund. It does not come. I, I, right, it doesn't come to the PDA. Right. And so, my last question or questions on the vehicle replacements are: When do you have to pay for them? Do you have to pay for them like in October? Would you order them, or do you have to pay in the? July, August time frame where you think you'll get it? So we have a couple of things that happen with those. We, we pay for those. Um, I imagine they'd have to have a deposit on it. But right. we get the cruiser in, and then we send it down to be it, fitted out. Fitted, right, the cage uh, and all that stuff, yeah. So we would have to pay some of it when we get the car itself, whenever that car comes in, we finalize payment on it. The second piece would be when they buy the equipment to be put in, so the, the cage, the lights, radios, all that stuff, whenever that's purchased, um, then they pay for the installation as that's done itself. So there, is there a possibility then that some of those payments would be made if it was after July of 2024, from the 2025 budget then? Well, we're putting that money in the uh, CIP fund so mm -hmm. that it, it rolls over so that it can be, it's there. Okay. As it, it, if, those, if those vehicles got in in November, they could very well be finished in June. Okay. And 100% and of the funds would be spent. We just roll next it over year. Yet. Right. If okay. it doesn't happen, then we would roll it over and it would be spent the next year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate I, it. I, I, do, I do have one quick question in regards still to the vehicle replacements. Yes. Is there any supply chain delays in, in vehicle yeah. replacements yeah. now? And, yeah, and how awesome. long have we been, we've been waiting for? There them? are, I am not so sure on the police cruisers. Ambulances are a very big issue, yeah, they um, and they're you know right. It, it, it's several years out, it, 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 probably a year and eighteen months at minimum on those things. Um, I'd have to defer to uh, to, to the PDU 
No, we, are, we are in the same situation. Yeah. That's why yeah. Ford has got this extraordinarily narrow window because they can't make them quickly enough. Mm -hmm. And that's why the delivery time is 14 months out. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, all right, thank you. Councilor Nelson. When DPW was in here yesterday, they were talking about they're having a serious problem getting parts for the cruisers and stuff like that. And now we're hearing about a delay. And I know back before when I was on the council, they phased out the Crown Vic and we were able to find a batch of them, got them in and we used them. But is it time to start maybe looking at a different make? I, I don't know that the, that the problem that's being described as to these Ford cars is any different as to any other brand. I'm hearing it from my chiefs that have departments that have Chevys. Um, it, it's, it's, I believe the supply, I know the supply chain issue is across the board. Because mm -hmm. I know a lot of departments are going to like the chargers and stuff like that. And, you know, Ford's made a lot of changes and trying to keep a uniform fleet's getting harder and harder to do. It is. A, a variable to also consider is that if the vehicle is sized differently, it causes a ripple effect as to all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Because if I can't transfer the cage that mm -hmm. fit this car into that car, mm -hmm. I'm back in front of you saying, by the way, I saved, I saved you some pennies here. The, the idea is outstanding, mm -hmm. but I saved you some pennies here, but it's going to cost over here on all the stuff that I need to buy. Right. And it's, it's not about the savings. It's about getting the car in less than 14 months and getting it on the road. Um, and then last year and this year, are the cameras in CIP? The, the, the street cams, those are CIP items, yes. Okay, so how much wasn't funded last year? Well, all of it. The ask was about the same, 185000 as okay. I recall, and it was, it was, it was redlined. Mm -hmm. So you would need three sixty this year to make up for last year also? If there was that degree of magnanimous, magnanimousness? Well, I think um, if, you just, if you take a look at any of these feeds that are all over Facebook and everything, it's a must. I mean, we were involved in getting the cameras in the cruisers back then, which was, and the lawsuits that it has saved this town is astronomical. And, you know, in Thompsonville and the intersections, the, the amount of time it could save the officers in investigating by just reviewing a video it is, I think it pays for itself. And that's how we have to look at it. Um, so it would be 360, okay. And then today, how many active officers do you have? Are you at full roster 100? No, sir. I'm sorry. I, uh, that was, let me just go. Yeah. He was out one. Yeah, I, I you must have missed that. I'm sorry. Believe, believe me, I am, I am very happy, very happy to reshare. I am slotted for 197 are budget funded. So that drops me. I'm at 97 is what I'm, 97 is what you've paid for. 100 is what I'm supposed to have. I got a resignation today that will be effective in a couple of weeks. It's Officer Jake Ryan, who is a rock star. Uh, so I thought it disingenuous to include him on this slide because at this moment I still have him. But think about him now as packing up his boxes. Additionally, I have uh, one out on workers' comp, one pregnancy light duty, and eight that are either in the six-month training academy or the four-month FTO program. So if I take the 97 and I back out the 10, it's 87. If you allow me to back out Jake Ryan, it's 86. Okay, so this goes back to what we talked about a couple months ago in the chambers about funding that additional officer to get them in the academy because you were at full staff for three days. Uh, I don't even think two, it was two and a half. Right. So, you know, this officer is never going to top 101 on the street because of our turnover and everything else. And again, this is critical. We live in a different world right now. We need to fund the officers. I was in downtown in a basement the other day and I saw two officers walking down the street and that's huge. And unfortunately, and I'll be the first to say it, Enfield is one of the towns that reacts to an incident. We don't, we don't protect. We only do it after something bad has happened. Then it's, you know, get the guys back down there. If they stay down there, they make a presence down there. People are going to go someplace else. And we all know it. And, and I've always stood that way. I still do. And, and again, 
I believe we should be, if it's 97 officers, it should be 98. I thought it was 100. It is, it, I'm authorized to go to 100. You've budget, fund, you've budget funded 97. Right. So for the sake of apples, apples, oranges, oranges, you would, you would fund 98 and tell me to go to 101. Right, right. Were you so inclined? And I appreciate the kind words, the kind thoughts, and certainly the, the support that all of you show. Well, we have no choice. I mean, we fund whatever happens. I, I mean, and the frivolous lawsuits nowadays are insane. They are just baiting you guys, trying anything. You know, you say the wrong word and it's a lawsuit now and it's got to stop. And the video that you guys all were, that's how it stops. It's that simple. And without that, I, I just, so um, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Ludwig. Hey, Chief, how you doing? Well, sir. Question, I'm going I'm to get a little technical on the budget. Just curious, what is the stipend in the budget? Uh, I think you're probably looking at the EMT stipend. Or it just says stipend, stipend on there. Uh, educate, education, education stipend, EMT, Mr. Blunder, yeah, education, if an uh, officer has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or oh, something yeah. like that. Contractual, say, what about separation pay? That's the buyout that's for, that's the accumulated buyout under the town charter for uh, sick time. Um, or contract by contract. But, it's yeah. contractual. It's actually, yeah, it's actually in the charter. So I may have thinking about the charter for... Uh, non-unionized employees, yeah. but yeah, separation pay is a chunk of money that sits there for, for the buyout of employees when they separate so they retire. and they retire. Uh, if they resign, they, there's less of a buyout. And so what, what about health services? You have a separate line item for that. That is uh, medical testing for new hires. Got it. Um, so I'm just, in, in your presentation, just curious, where does it fall You know, in supply, when you have about 400 grand in supplies and materials, is that what you presented it already in there? What you presented in your you know, up here, some of the things, your excess. Is that it within those supplies? And Can you see which specific item? I don't have that book in front of me. Yes, office so supplies. So I can try to tie the presentation. Understood. Before, Understood. You know, office yeah. supplies, technology supplies, custodial supplies. Same with here, yeah. It's likely an amalgam of all the individual right. things that I'm breaking down. So yeah, that, that's equipment repair and vehicle repairs. Um, so anything that breaks, I tried to go as granular as I could okay, yeah. to try to explain. You know, that. I, I, yeah, no worries. Um, thank you. Um, so overtime is the Thompson. Does it still a separate line item? The Thompsonville locking. It's not in your overtime, right? That or is it included? It is, no, it is. A, it is well. It is. It we is. We used to have a separate line item yes. for it. It is. It is still an independent. I mean, when I when I budget for it. You put it. You put it in my budget. It used to not be in my budget. Right, correct. But I have it under my umbrella, and I bill it to a specific Thompsonville revitalization walking patrol. So it's, it's a different light item than your overtime and your your overtime budget, or is it? You mean in your overtime light item? No, it's rolled into my overtime. Okay, yeah, and same with Scanic River. Correct. Right. Which when, is when we put people at the Scanic, as we will Friday, starting Saturdays, about three weeks. Right? Starting in about three weeks. So that so, comes out of my overtime. So my question now, now, so again. Are we going to start towing? So we spend any overtime money, and again, unfortunately, I know, or or so I won't get into towing. Or we already reached out to DEP to make sure we don't fall behind like we did last year when we worked it out the year before. Again, where again, folks weren't calling it all upset because they were parking on people's lawns down, or yeah. So has that already happened? That is that that is happening. I am very comfortable with what we are doing on the streets outward. I suspect that the DEP statement is going to be that they are not going to have a park ranger for us within the park. Right, right. They've been advertising for it. I've seen the advertisements. I actually tried to root one of my college students who wants to be an NCOT police officer for that job. We talked about going to the high school kids at one point. All right, so I'm uh, curious. So where is the, the, are the SROs included in your 86 slash, or is that set for other... That's, no, included, that's all the four included. four SROs are in there? All included. What about the 250 for the re remaining uh, overtime that we use? Included. Included in your regular overtime, included. so it's not separated. Okay, so that's part of that overtime. It budget. is. 
That's interesting. Did we have that separated last year? I thought we did a different line. So I, I mean, so what I'm saying is, uh, look, you know, I'm, I'm tough on overtime too, and I agree with Deputy Mayor's Deputy Mayor's. But if you've actually included that 250 and the time, so I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. The Thompsonville walking patrols and the 250 for the schools, that's included in the budget item I see is 779, 924. Correct. So that's actually a change. So 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 I'll say yes, this to you. This right, this year. It's a change. So that's actually when I'm looking at your overtime. You gotta appreciate the fact that you're managing it the way we talked about this when we went at it like five years ago. Because those are separate line items that we had separately at one point. I don't remember when we changed. But so I, that's so I mean you're actually managing a tighter overtime budget. I mean I'm giving you credit here. I, I want to be <laughs> and, 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 and who am I to who am I to, to bat it away? But I right. want to say this. The number that is in the book may or may not be the number that is hit. And right, no, I get it. No, I get it. Completely understand it. But I'm saying that I know we had separate line items and it was still a pretty significant number which we had those conversations. I do not see in any budget that's ever been finalized or approved or given to me a separate right. a separate breakout that this is for this, this is for this. Right. Instead, it's this much money and spend it in these functions. Yeah. So again, on your presentation, I appreciate it. i got a couple more questions, I'll be done. Curious with the car that you mentioned about you know surveillance and a drug, which I'm all for. But curious, and I know this is gonna probably be a people are gonna be upset with this question, but we're gonna be at some point pot will be being sold in this town. How does that affect how you were doing some undercover drug undercover drug operation? I know you mentioned the bus you got were significant marijuana. I mean, but they're gonna be you know enforcing it was approved to be sold. How does that affect what you're gonna be doing? What's the need? So I understand there's other drugs, I'm not naive. But really, what's that car going to be needed for? If in theory you go and buy it, you know, no, because because uh, an, in, an individual out of his house can't have fifty pounds or so of marijuana. Right. The legalization of marijuana is extraordinarily strict. Some would say not strict enough. Some would say too strict. Right? Um, at retail with a licensed vendor, it does not approve. We actually had an arrest recently where the arrestee told the officer, "But marijuana is legal now." That doesn't mean that you are allowed to walk around with marijuana in a baggie in your pocket and sell it on the street right. corner. That's not what we're talking about right. here. Um, marijuana cases, bulk marijuana cases, uh, or any marijuana possession, utilization, or sale outside of that extraordinarily complex 79-page statute would still be criminal. Okay. Now, the DEA, for example, did not want that case. Correct. They right. want tractor-trailer loads of marijuana. Yeah. But from a state prosecution perspective, mm -hmm. you know how light marijuana is. Right. You know how hard it is to get the 50 pounds of marijuana. Right. That is still an arrestable offense and, and, a, and a good case that was. Well, appreciate the explanation. I think it's in um, two last questions. Again, get in the weeds with you. I appreciate the detail. Curious, what is a no reason code for overtime? That's holidays. Right? Um, As a contractual. Dumb benefit. question. We had overtime for sale, daylight savings. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Sir, <laughs> sure, it's not me. You're so working so nine hours instead of eight. So you actually get paid. You gotta, yeah, you're getting paid for the time you're working. Awesome. Uh, that's interesting. Thank you. Right. Do we gain an hour on the backside of it? No, sir. Yeah, we ask for the money. No, sir. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so I was a joke. I saw it. But, so, but I think with the court not reopening, how much of our cost will have gone up and will continue to go up? And again, I think, and I know I asked you this question, you got, but folks need to understand there is an impact to arrests. I mean, so when, you know, to coordinate what we're paying for, you know, in this, this budget to pay, oh yeah, then we should be getting X amount of arrests. But when we, they're no longer being prosecuted in Enfield, they're going down to Hartford. I think this is a great time for you to explain <coughs> the cost, because there is, I think it's pretty significant based on some of the numbers I've seen. And oh, by the way, unfortunately, some people, again, some cases may get thrown out. Or I know some have, already have. And again, without having to get detail, but I think there is a cost that people don't realize that now we've taken on because they won't, they closed the, the courthouse in Enfield. I agree wholeheartedly, and I, I'm hoping it made it to you. After my last council appearance, I generated a memo in response to your request. Yes. I'm hoping it made it to you. you. Did, yeah. So, so I, I think it's important for the public to understand it. There was uh, there is an there is a considerable impact, and it's economic. Yeah. Um, I also think <coughs> it's non-economic. Frankly, the aggravation factor. There are uh, there's considerable lost time, and okay, so it's a salaried employee, it's an hourly employee, it's a unionized employee. But to the extent that that officer is driving the right. defendant 
back and down and back and forth to court. To the extent paperwork is getting sent back and forth to court in Hartford, it's also not an easy drive. Parking is not easy. Victims and witnesses that have to go to court, officers that have to go to court. I also fear, I'm going to be careful, but I fear that matters that in Enfield previously might have generated a certain wow, just by definition, right. don't always generate the same wow in the Hartford area. Um, you know, the, the, the state made some very difficult decisions, and I understand that they had to do that, but your point is well made. The loss of that court, uh, philosophically, from, a, from a, a thump our chest point of view, from a convenience and from an economic point of view, was considerable. And so and that is perfect what Councillor Nelson said. So that ties for me. So when you're saying, you know what? The loss of man hours, or, or women, I'm sorry, man or woman hours, hours, personnel. personnel. That, so how does that translate into what we need for personnel, right? So you're, you're, you're just exactly saying, instead of having someone patrol, they're in a car going down, and there is there is a now a value of, a, of an FTE. And I don't know if you can do that, but if you could put that somehow to the very best of your ability, and I, again, if you, just saying, that would be perfect to be able to defend, look, this is why we need a couple extra folks, because unfortunately, we just can't go to the Anfield Courthouse anymore. We're spending X amount of hours now going down to Hartford on a daily basis or whatever it may be. And guess what? So we don't have someone you know, who's patrolling anymore. Yeah, the, the people that are running back and forth to the court are typically the court officer and the evidence officer. Yeah. So they are less efficient in their jobs because they're spending more time traveling. Right. The impact on patrol should, um, it, it'd be, it'd be extreme. I hate to say it. I know it's hard. I see what you're going it's something with. to think about. When, when the officer would have gone to Enfield to find a judge to get an RPO approved, the officer now has to go to Hartford. But the frequency with which it happens, the cost now, it would be, it would be a, just a guess. Yep. It's considerable. I, I think it's valuable because I think that is an impact that is real to our community. I just, I don't know yeah. that I can yeah. quantify it. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank, Thank you. you. I just have one other question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, the scanning. If you remember, we went down and we actually talked to them, and there was some conversation that was had about the state maybe covering some of our officers overtime. Have we gotten anything on that that you know of? No, because there was a conversation that day. But they said no. Yeah. Yeah. It is a no. Okay, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what the actual end result was. There will be no coverage provided by the chief. All right, I know we worked yeah, on it. We tried. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we tried working on that. Yeah, no, no. I just. So, you know, and it's, you know, the NCD has right. really done yeah. a nice job of. I, I'm not. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But, you know, it's unfortunate that the state won't kick something right. in for that. No, but again, it is what it yeah. is. So, okay, yeah. thanks, Bob. Okay. Councilor Manji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so, and your thank department you. for phenomenal you. work. I appreciate it. The question I have has to do with grants. Are there any grants out there? I know at one time there was one grant, and I think they did away with it. But is there anything else coming down the pike? So we have gotten grants. Uh, they've been nibbling around the edge grants. They have been for the dog. Mm -hmm. They have been for some of the canine supplies. Uh, there were one or two when I first got here for some technical type items and equipment. Um, there, the, the, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, saw a string of grants. They were called Cops More, Cops Fast, and Cops Now. Those grants have dried up a long time ago. Uh, the short answer is there is nothing immediately available that is going to fund an FTE type of position. Okay. We, we, we nibble around the edges where we can. Uh, Officer Dennis Roach has become, and he raised his hand to do it, he's become a, I'll try to write grants for you. Uh, Officer Sergeant Emmons, Detective Sergeant Emmons, put in for one recently, and it was a competitive grant, and we thought we had a good shot. It was going to provide us some equipment for the EJOC. It was gonna provide us for some equipment that we hoped we could use to, to do the inside, from the walls in on the new building addition that we're hoping for. Uh, it was a competitive grant. We had support from Joe Courtney's office. We were not selected for that. Uh, we remain vigilant. So we keep looking at We them. certainly do. I, I, get, I get them myself and I push them out to the appropriate people. Thank you. Thank you. 
right, well, Steve. Um, just quickly, Chief, yeah. the, you mentioned that you recently uh, acquired about maybe 100000 in asset for through the drug bust. Does that money go directly into the asset forfeiture fund, or does it go into a regional pool and you get back a certain percentage? So under both the state and the federal formula, there is a cost sharing that goes into it. Okay. Um, the downside of that is that when there is a great seizure in Enfield, we have to share it with other departments. The upside of that is when there's a great seizure out of Enfield, we get a portion of that. Um, the case that we had last week, because the state needed to prosecute that and not the feds, that's gonna go through the state asset forfeiture process. The state asset forfeiture process and whatever we realize from that, because the state statute calls for a large portion of that, uh, whatever seized, to go toward drug prevention efforts. Enforcement only gets a small piece of that. Okay. So that a portion of it will go to us, but that will be limited because it's state asset forfeiture to drug enforcement activities. Okay. I get much more flexibility when we get federal asset forfeiture. That is one of the benefits that we enjoy of having a detective in the DEA task force. Okay. 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 Great. Well, Chief, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Please, uh, greatly appreciate it. Very informative today, and uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and one last uh, thing. No. Oh, Ellen said she can make it available next Wednesday if you guys want to have another deliberation. Or well, we're having one Monday, correct? Yeah. yeah. I would, I would, my, my opinion is that you should set it up. Yes. I think yeah. we should probably... Yeah. Put Wednesday um, in yeah, the calendar, even though I already made plans. Well, I, I would say <laughs> definitely Wednesday, and if we have to go to next Thursday, yeah. we would do that. Yeah. I would put those two dates as tentative dates. So the ten. So we, we will be meeting on Monday. We will be discussing CIP, and we also will be do, talking yeah. with. Uh, and Monday is at six. John Wilcox is it six is on Monday? Six o'clock yeah. on Monday. No no, six o'clock, and we will have. I think have she was dinner. doing. Oh, we're doing dinner. I think Oh, okay. I'm just, all right. The ninth is the opioid piece, so okay. Do we have uh, a motion to adjourn it? Counselor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Counselor Finger, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much.